Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons lore full time and have a collection of over 700 videos on monster ecology, fantasy world history, character classes and magic items on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button below or backing me on Patreon where you can get access to all of the scripts I write for these vids. Members have either also become members of the Secret of Gluminati on my Discord server and of course Subscribe to me here as I upload at least twice a week and have a live stream every weekend. Since we have covered one of the most technologically advanced but magic tech civilizations that Faerun has ever seen, I think it's time to have a conversation about the true capabilities of what you hold in your hands if you happen to own a Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition. I'm also going to chat about some of the more horrendously terrible things your player characters can get their greedy and irresponsible mitts on and how to deal with that in any role-playing games you care to run. So technology and Dungeons and Dragons, I know I've talked about this a little bit in the past, how to run a Spelljammer or Planescape style adventure and how to go full on science fiction. I mean, with just the Dungeon Master's Guide and Player's Handbook, you can use the 5th edition game mechanics to run any game setting. From Lord of the Rings to Warhammer 40k, Death Watch Space Marines, from Doctor Who to Star Wars to Marvel Superheroes to Stargate Atlantis to Sliders to Judge Dredd to Call of Cthulhu. There are a few out there who will tell you that Dungeons & Dragons is a tired old system. They only use other game mechanics because of whatever personal opinions they have and will go on at great length. But I'm telling you, D&D is the original and most popular role-playing game system because it is just like the basic framework that you can add any tweaks and adjustments to that you want and roll off any sort of custom hot rod game setting you'd like with it. You literally don't need anything else. So if all you have familiarity with is the Dungeons and Dragons rules, don't buy into all that subtle or not so subtle negging from role players who play lots of different rule sets. D&D can do everything any other system can do. And when the story and group are really swinging, the rules don't matter anyway. If you really take the time to read and experiment with D&D, you will never need to buy any other gaming system that you can't take the story elements and interesting game quirks from and just put them into the D&D rules with ease. You want me to run a world of like Conan the Barbarian, but a Star Trek away team turns up to help the Barbarian tribes fight off an invasion of Daleks from Doctor Who? I won't even break a sweat. I can handle that with three pages from the Dungeon Master's Guide, one page of notes, and some spells from the player's handbook. You want to know how? Let's bring it on. Here are the pages I'm talking about. Grab your Dungeon Master's Guide with me and turn to page 119. You'll see a flying airship docked alongside a mountaintop tower with a waterfall plunging down perilous cliff faces. And at the top of the page is a table called Airborne and Waterborne Vehicles. The very first item on the table is an airship, its base cost, its airspeed, crew complement, typical passenger capacity, cargo weight allowance, armor class, hit points, and while other ships have a damage threshold, meaning a minimum amount you need to inflict to even damage the ship, the fragility of the airship is represented by no damage threshold. These numbers are your basic guideline for a vessel like the one in the image on the page. Obviously, nobody cares if the solid cabins and decks and hull under the airship balloon gets holes punched in it. What really matters is damage to the sails and the flotation balloon, which are quite vulnerable to damage. The rest of the ship, all the wood bits, will have a damage threshold and extra hit points if it makes sense that they should. In which case, look at the other ships on the table and figure it out. Hey presto, you have the game mechanics you need for any sort of adventure that involves flying vehicles that are not actual creatures. Look at the last paragraph on that page. It tells you exactly how fast 8 miles per hour flight speed is in feet per rounds and miles per day. That's the same as the speed of the airship on the chart. Okay, next page. Flip to page 255 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Here we have siege equipment, ballista, which is like a crossbow built for giants. The cannon, cauldrons of boiling oil, the ramming log, a slightly more advanced version than a log on a wooden cart, the mangonel and trebuchet, both designed to hurl heavy stones or disease-ridden corpses over or at castle walls. Notice that all of these heavy weapon systems use 10-sided dice for the damage they inflict. They also have an armor class and hit points of their own because they may be targeted for attack. If two ships of equal speed are fighting each other and one manages to take out the weapons on board the other one, they can simply stay try to stay away within weapons range and take the other ship apart. 
until the enemy attempts to run away. One of the best ways to do that is being able to turn unexpectedly back at the attacker and zip past them while they take extra distance to turn themselves around and follow, thereby gaining some ground on them. It's risky though, as they can get a close shot with their weapons, a broadside, as they double back past them. So in games with lots of ship combat, there are rules for the turning speed that is normally represented by how far the ship has to move to perform a turn. But because that's all that really matters, how much distance it eats up to swing that sucker around, either to bring weapons to bear on the target or to give chase. Now, we have the basic ranged weapon attack bonus for these heavy weapons, and I see no reason why a character with the sailor background on page 139 of the player's handbook could not add their proficiency bonus to this attack roll. Because the vehicle is a tool, their background gives them skill at using, not just steering the ship, but making basic repairs and using onboard weapons. The attributes don't matter a damn with these sort of weapons, just hands-on experience in using them. Now, the ballista does piercing damage, 3d10. Its normal range is 120 feet. Beyond that, the attack roll has disadvantage, rolling two 20-sided dice and using the lower result. Its maximum effective range is 480 feet. Beyond that, it just hits the water or ground or sails off into the void. However, you combine that weapon with divination magic in the form of a ballistic targeting system, and you could perhaps double double those ranges in atmospheric or void or phlogist in combat, like if you're fighting somebody in the plane of air. Also, you can change the damage type to radiant and swap the loading time description to be how long it takes the power cells to build up a firing charge. And now it's a laser cannon. You don't even need to change the numbers at all. They're all exactly the same, except now it goes pew pew. Cannons, range and damage don't change much regardless of how technologically or magically advanced they are. It's the size and portability and speed of the cannon that gets enhanced mainly. So at their very best, you can reduce the time between firing the cannon by one round for really advanced firing devices. And as I mentioned, add a proficiency bonus to the attack roll for a skilled operator or even a high-tech or enchanted guidance and targeting system. But at best, it would be like plus four added to the base of plus six to hit. Missile combat can use the exact same listings as the mangonel and the trebuchet, unless the missile is high-tech and self-guided, or enchanted to fly on its own, in which case, treat it like a flying creature. Easily done. And if they have a high-tech guidance system on board, there's a cantrip called Guidance on page 248 of the player's handbook. It adds 1d4 to the hit bonus. So there you go. The intent is to keep even a high-tech guided missile no more formidable than a plus 10 to hit its target. And in 5th edition, that is plenty. It's a lot easier to hit things in 5th edition, which is another reason to be very, very careful about ever increasing the rate of fire of any weapon. Okay, high-tech handheld weapons are covered on page 268 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. But before we go there, also on page 248 of the Player's Handbook, is the first level evocation spell called Guiding Bolt. It takes one round to cast and serves two purposes. First, it's a laser beam. Second, it's a laser dot that lights up the target for a moment and makes them easier to hit. Okay, now flip to page 268 of the DMG. The laser rifle does 3d8 radiant damage and has a range of 100 feet with a maximum range of 300 feet. The Guiding Bolt spell inflicts 46 radiant damage and it has a range of 120 feet, which is also its maximum range. Obviously, spellcasters have only a limited number of first level spells they can fire off in combat, and the laser rifle has a clip with 30 shots worth of energy. You can easily adjust this, but extra reloads can be carried around and it only takes a round to reload the rifle. The damage from the rifle never gets any better, and the hit bonus is limited to just a possible proficiency bonus of the character's skill using the weapon. Guiding Bolt, damage increases with the level of the character, and they get to make a ranged combat roll with the spell, which means they get to add their spell casting ability modifier and their proficiency bonus. However, don't forget that they get disadvantage of making a ranged spell attack with an enemy within 5 feet of them, also known as standing adjacent and ready to maim them. So the spell slinger is trying to zot something at a distance and defend themselves at the same time. It's nice that they give adventurers credit for actually being able to do that in 5th edition instead of them automatically being vulnerable to getting attacked. 
attacks of opportunity could be a real pain in the ass. Many spells can be easily converted into high-tech weapons or devices, but as with the laser rifle versus guiding bolt spell example, there's always a trade-off between overall damage and accuracy compared to how frequently the device can be used compared to spells. In short, high-tech or arcane devices should never be more powerful than the spell, but can be used more frequently, and they must use up some sort of expensive and difficult to replace resource such as a power cell, enchanted crystal, rare substance, or just wear out and become non-functional after a certain amount of use and need to be repaired, recalibrated, or whatever. Also, devices are breakable. They can be dropped, disarmed, or stolen. They also have difficulty operating in all the same environments that a spell can. But that is very much up to your personal logic in any given situation. I leave that up to your common sense. Okay, so we covered flying ships and ray guns. For machine guns and grenades, the rules are very simple. The burst rule for automatic weapons is a bit more complicated. It's on the page right before the one with the table on it. So page 267 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. It goes like this. Your character pulls the trigger and sprays bullets, up to 10 of them, from the magazine to hit anything they can in a 10 foot cube area within the normal range of the weapon. It can't be longer range. So if their character has disadvantage on the shot, the spray of bullets is going to go wild and miss. All the targets in that area automatically get to make a difficulty 15 dexterity saving throw. It doesn't say they have to be able to see the attack coming or be able to dodge out of the way. It simply represents a bit of random luck really. Grenades are thrown weapons. They're excellent delivery devices for explosives and very science fiction-y effects using some scary spells. Fragmentation Grenade is the default type that 5th edition assumes the characters will be throwing at the enemy. You can just use the Fireball spell for a high explosive grenade, add the effects of a Hail of Thorns first level conjuration spell if it has a fragmentation casing. Fog Cloud is exactly the same as the Smoke Grenade, listed in the DMG. You can get really high tech with these weapons. My favourites are the grenades used by Strontium Dog Bounty Hunter Johnny Alpha and the 2000 AD comics franchise. Alpha is armed with highly advanced technology including a variable cartridge blaster, electrified brass knuckles, a short range teleporter, a time drogue that can briefly rewind the last few minutes of time, and the time bombs, which can transport somebody minutes or hours forwards or backwards in time, by which time the planet has moved around in its orbit so the victim appear, reappears in empty space. Misty Step is perfect for a short-range teleportation device, time stop, gate, reverse gravity, all excellent high-tech bombs, and you can use art artifacts like a sphere of annihilation to represent a black hole generator, or something equally exotic and terrifying. Something like Doctor Who's TARDIS is simply Morden Kanan's magnificent mansion with the ability to mass teleport and plane shift. It follows the same sort of rules as a demi-plane on the inside, and it's been kind of established that the artifact is self-aware to a certain extent, with senses that mimic a lot of divination magic. That's it. So, magic is technology, technology is magic. You have all the tools you require to create any science fiction game you want to. Teleportation, planet gateways, time travel, hyperspace, warp drives, phaser pistols, cell phones, robots, zombies, ray guns, squid-faced aliens, xenomorphs, space marines, parallel dimensions, time travel, stargates. Just ask yourself, first of all, do I even need to use the rules for this part of the story? And if so, can I cover it with those pages in the Dungeons Master's Guide? Uh, with a few notes on any tweaks you're making, or if you need to use the player's handbook, what spell is that like? What page is it on? And you're good to go. After a while, you get a pretty good idea of what spells you will use far more often and perhaps make a ring binder with copies of the pages. A few bits of artwork you found on the internet that you can show to your players because who doesn't love a snazzy looking ray gun or a steampunk jetpack? When you reduce a game like Call of Cthulhu down to its bare bones. It's low fantasy D&D with madness tables and jump scares, where the player characters are pretty much going to come to a sticky end and everyone is okay with it. Most of the fun of that game is, is going into the investigation of something supernatural and horrible, knowing full well you're not going to like what you find along the way, but everyone's going along with the dark lure of the slippery slope into Eldritch Doom. So really, it's all in the narrative, not the mechanics. Take away all the pros and really, what is the Call of Cthulhu rule system? Most 
alternative role-playing system. Start off with game designers playing around with different ways to use dice. Dice pool systems with proprietary dice of uh, w- with unusual systems are basically just a money grab. I find them pretty slow and annoying to play, to be honest. 100% I'm going to use an app on my phone instead of spending money on weird dice I don't even want to use. Here is what most of those systems are trying to do in a nutshell. When you roll a skill check or an attack roll, roll another six-sided die. You are either going to pass the skill check or the attack roll or not, and the six-sided die determines a chance something good or bad happens as well in the general narrative of the story. So call it a plot or complication roll and save yourself a couple of hundred dollars of rule books and silly dice. You can run Star Wars with 5th edition with three pages, a notepad, and the player's handbook. A Jedi is just no more complicated than playing a Githzerai Eldritch Knight or a monk. Soldiers are fighters, scoundrels, and pilots are just bards and rogues. Most spaceship combat and travel comes down to fuel supplies, mechanical problems, space monsters, travel time, and how well a ship churns, how far its guns can shoot, and is it faster than whatever it's chasing or is being chased by. That's it. If you want to throw in force fields, which is, you better do that if you're playing Star Trek because those crew sections are made of tissue paper, seriously, and nobody wears any emergency inflatable vac vac suits, force fields are either going to be a bubble that everything hits first and just overloads and shuts down when it runs out of hit points, or they're going to be directional, which means there are gaps and the force field has a regular armor class that it's possible to bypass. Variable weapons and protection is perfectly handled by ray guns and force fields that switch damage and resistance between different damage types. Star Trek, again, handles this quite well with phases and borgs. A game of Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition, Dungeon Crawl Classics, Osric, any of the zillions of D&D themed games are no more or less fun because of the rules. And if you do like a rules mechanic from one of those systems, like the stunts you can use in Fantasy Age, Just grab that and put it into whatever game you're running. The narrative, the story, the ability to work things out quickly, consistently and fairly is the whole point. If you're pretty confident that you can wing it, you can run a game with almost no prep, no published module, just some scraps of paper, a pencil, a set of dice and some snacks. I know these days there are a lot of published adventure modules available, but honestly, back in the day and in most of the games I play, we don't use them. We will read them grab bits that we like, and make our own stories, often unfolding as we play, with only a rough idea of what's actually going to unfold. The concept of a path to an adventure with a defined finish to the story is the bias of writers bleeding over into role-playing games. There's no need for an ending to a campaign. When you think about it, the story is about the player characters and what they consider to be the end of their adventuring days. That's all that really matters. So, to sum it all up, You have all you need to play any sort of RPG story. It's a tool that can be adapted very easily. You don't need to buy into the idea that Dungeons & Dragons has any limitations. Most of the people who say things like that have other motives that have nothing to do with the rule set and its true capabilities. So look for what they're actually dissatisfied with. You may end up following them down a spiral of spending money on different game systems with them abandoning one after the other, when really it had nothing to do with the rules or the setting at all. They were just looking for a community within the hobby who was more in tune with their personality and politics. Several hundred hundred dollars worth of dust gathering rule books and dice sets later, you'll come to this realization. Some people don't like D&D simply because it's so popular, and they spout a whole lot of absolute nonsense in order to justify a bias that is nothing more than their own personal quirks. Also, keep in mind, nobody is somehow endangering the game or the hobby by playing it how they have, however the hell they want. But anyone who thinks there is no difference between a home game with good friends, a game shop with people they have only met a few times while gaming, or a gaming convention with people they've never met before and may not meet again, or even a broadcast game or a Twitch or YouTube game, or the fact that any decent, sane human being should be mindful of the age of the people they're playing with, the environment that they are playing in, and the responsibility they have not to make other others feel skeeved out, revolted, unsafe, or traumatized by proxy, have fucking sociopathic problems, and they are an actual source of all the problems in the hobby, causing all the actual damage. Play what you want, play it however you want. Play responsibly, and don't buy into the bullshit. There is a box on your character sheet for their flaws 
there's no box on there for your own. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for all the full scripts for these videos. Subscribe to Viewer Prime with my sign up code AJ Pickett for a five day free trial and low, low price of four bucks per month for the best content, as well as some of uh, other channels on their ever growing lineup of diverse things, including quite a few anime and Bollywood shows. Buy some sweet merchandise from my Teespring shop. We're your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.